Hello friends, my name is Mr. CJ and today we're going to read a story called The Eye That Never Sleeps. It's a non-fiction story about Detective Alan Pinkerton who was hired to protect our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, from an assassination attempt from Southern rebels before he was to be sworn in as president. So the author of our story today is Marissa Moss and her illustrator is Jeremy Holmes. So here we go. What does it take to be a great detective? Do you need to be strong or rich or powerful? Alan Pinkerton wasn't any of those things. Born in 1819, he grew up in one of the worst slums in Scotland. But he had sharp eyes, a quick mind, and a hunger for justice. That passion for fairness led him to join a group promoting workers' rights. For years, the British government considered him a nuisance, then a criminal. When soldiers came to arrest him on his wedding day, Pinkerton fled with his bride, hiding on a ship that took them to America. They made their way to Chicago, where Pinkerton started a cooperage, a barrel business. In the 1840s, practically everything was stored and shipped in barrels, from flour to apples and oil to wine. Pinkerton's shop was so successful that he soon had eight men working for him. One day in 1847, Pinkerton ran out of lumber, so he went to an island in a nearby river, a place where he often collected wood. With his keen eyes, he noticed something more than wood, the remains of a campfire. Why would anybody camp out there? The island was isolated, not a natural place to stop while hunting or fishing or traveling. Pinkerton was curious. He went back to the island night after night, waiting for the mysterious campers to return. On a dark night, with only a sliver of moon in the sky, he discovered a ragtag group of men making something in a fire. Pinkerton couldn't see exactly what they were doing, only that the objects were small. There could be only one reason to make something late at night, hidden from everyone. Pinkerton shared his suspicions with the local sheriff. When the sheriff and his men went to the island the next night, Pinkerton came along. And that's how he helped capture a gang of counterfeiters, men making coins out of tin and lead. When fake banknotes started appearing in a nearby town, the merchants asked Pinkerton to help. He caught the coin counterfeiters. Could he find the forgers of paper money too? Pinkerton couldn't resist the challenge of solving the puzzle. He relied on the same skills he'd used so long ago in the slums, sharp eyes and a quick mind, and he caught the crooks. The Chicago police were so impressed they hired him as their first full-time detective. After a year on the force, Pinkerton decided to open his own agency. Pinkerton relied on observation, logical deduction, and an understanding of people and their behavior. But he needed more than that to run an agency. He needed other agents with the same skills. To teach these new detectives, Pinkerton wrote the Pinkerton Method and Manual. One how to shadow a suspect so he doesn't think you're following him. Two, how to disguise yourself and play a role using the agency's large closet filled with cl clothes, wigs, and false mustaches. How, three, how to engage suspects in conversation. Four, how to remember clues without taking notes a suspect might find later. And five, how to be determined and patient and observant. He also taught his agents to keep an open mind, to look for proof, and most of all, to search for the truth. Justice above all. His method worked so well, by the 1850s, the Pinkerton Agency was the most successful detective agency in the country. Pinkerton solved more than 300 murders and recovered millions of dollars in stolen money. His sharp eye inspired the company logo with the slogan, We Never Sleep. In 1860, Pinkerton was hired by the president of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad to protect the line from sabotage by secessionists, people advocating for the South to leave the Union. The rebels had warned they would blow up tracks around Washington, D.C., cutting off the capital from supplies. Investigating these threats, Pinkerton heard disturbing rumors. A group in Baltimore was planning to ambush and kill Abraham Lincoln on his way to being sworn in as president. At first, Pinkerton thought the talk was just that, a lot of idle chatter, but he kept hearing troubling snippets from different sources, so Pinkerton sent agents to Baltimore, two men and one woman. Their job was to pose as secessionists 
infiltrate the ring and learn about the plot. The news was even worse than Pinkerton feared. The plan included drawing lots to see which plotter would actually fire a deadly shot. The leaders worried that the chosen man might hesitate, so instead of one piece of red paper, they put in eight. Eight men would shoot at Lincoln as he rode through Baltimore on his way from one train depot to another. Once the deed was done, another group of conspirators would telegraph the news to their headquarters in Richmond, then cut all telegraph lines, destroy all bridges, and tear up all train tracks to keep word from traveling north. Pinkerton had to warn the president-elect. The inaugural trip from Springfield, Illinois to Washington, D.C. had been carefully organized to give as many Americans as possible the opportunity to see the new president and show their support in this tense, divisive time. The journey was meant to bring together a country on the verge of breaking apart over the heated issue of slavery. Lincoln gave a speech at each whistle stop. Crowds lined the streets to see his carriage pass and they surged into the hotels where he stayed. People followed him everywhere, even into private rooms. An aide was even hurt by the crushing mob. How could Pinkerton protect one man in such a throng? Not trusting the mail or telegraph wires, Pinkerton set an agent, Kate Warren, to set up an appointment so he could meet with Lincoln, then follow her to Philadelphia, the next city on the president's route. That night, he pushed his way through the excited crowds in the lobbies and halls of the Continental Hotel. People were even gathered right outside Lincoln's door. The city was friendly to the president-elect. Here, the hordes of people weren't a threat. What would it be like, though, with the angry mobs in Baltimore, a city with strong southern sympathies? Pinkerton was led into the hotel room by Norman Judd, an Illinois state senator and close friend of Lincoln. The detective quickly outlined all the risks and how to avoid them. In his case notes, he wrote, Mr. Lincoln was cool, calm, and collected. In fact, he did not appear to me to realize the great danger which was threatening him at the moment. Still, the president-elect agreed to Pinkerton's plan, so long as he didn't miss a single public event. The train had already zigged and zagged through Indianapolis, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Buffalo, Albany, New York, and Philadelphia. That still left Harrisburg and the last stop before D.C., Baltimore. Lincoln's route had been publicized in newspapers for weeks beforehand. Everyone knew he would arrive in Baltimore the morning of February 23rd. So the evening of the 22nd, the president's party, without the president, boarded the Harrisburg-Baltimore-D.C. train. Lincoln would have had a more convoluted route. He would take a special train back to Philadelphia from Harrisburg, then one directly to Baltimore from Philadelphia. The route was longer, but would get him to Baltimore earlier than the official presidential train. This was the trickiest part, as Lincoln would board the Baltimore-bound train in plain view of the other passengers and crew. So instead of his trademark stovepipe hat, he wore a soft hat and a shawl wrapped around his shoulders. Kate Warren, the Pinkerton agent, was waiting for the president in the sleeping car of the Philadelphia to Baltimore train not the special presidential one that had already left with Mrs. Lincoln. She told the conductor she needed the secluded rear berth for herself and her invalid brother. In her detective report, Warren noted, Mr. Lincoln is very homely and so very tall that he could not lay straight on his berth. The excitement seemed to keep us all awake. Nothing of importance happened through the night. Meanwhile, an extra precaution to be sure that the conspirators couldn't warn anyone of a change in travel plans Pinkerton had the telegraph wires fixed so that any dispatches between Harrisburg and Baltimore would be intercepted and delivered straight to Pinkerton himself. But what if Lincoln's train missed the transfer in Philadelphia? Pinkerton couldn't take the chance that the Baltimore-bound train would leave without the president. So he asked the railroad superintendent to instruct the conductor that the train couldn't leave until a important package arrived. The wrapped parcel, looking very official, arrived shortly after Lincoln did and was given to the conductor along with the permission to leave. What was in the important package? A newspaper. Just something to be sure the train waited for its important passenger, the real package. All along the train tracks, Pinkerton set up agents to signal if tracks ahead had been destroyed and to warn of any danger. As the train chuffed out of the station, Pinkerton scanned the tracks ahead, looking for a bright beam of light to assure him that all was well. At every bridge crossing, the lights flashed. Go ahead. Go ahead. No danger here. 
The train reached Baltimore in darkness at 3.30 a.m. Instead of the planned presidential parade in full light of day through the streets from one train depot to the other, the sleeping car was quietly detached from the Philadelphia train and drawn by horses along the streets to the Camden Street Station. The streets were still, the silence broken only by the sound of the horses' hooves. The conspirators were all asleep in their beds, waiting for morning to attack Lincoln. Once at the station, the train was due to leave right away for D.C. Fifteen minutes went by, then an hour, and still the train didn't leave. Two tense hours passed with the sleeping cars stuck in the station. Nobody was sleeping, Pinkerton least of all. Lincoln joked quietly that the city of Baltimore loved him more than Pinkerton thought, since it was keeping him there so long. Finally, the train started moving. It had been waiting for late-arriving cargo from the west. Pinkerton didn't relax until after arriving in D.C. shortly before dawn. After safely delivering the president-elect, Pinkerton sent a coded telegram to his partner at the detective agency back in Chicago. Plum has nuts. Ari at Barley. All right. E.J. Allen. E.J. Allen was the fake name of Pinkerton, always used while undercover. Plum's was code for Pinkerton. Parley was code for DC. You can guess who Nuts was code for. When the conspirators heard their plot had failed, they fled Baltimore, heading south to fight for the Confederacy. One of Lincoln's first acts as president was to create the Secret Service to spy on the Confederacy and catch Southern spies, many of whom were working in DC. He knew just the man to lead this top security group, Alan Pinkerton. The boy who had grown up in a slum was now working for the President of the United States. Using those skills developed long ago, sharp eyes, a keen mind, and a passion for justice. His agency still exists today. The eye never sleeps. And that, my friends, is the end of our nonfiction tale, The Eye That Never Sleeps. See you later.